Let's talk about exponents. Before we try to actually compute with them, let's talk about notation for just a second. So 2 to power 3, for example, we call this number 2 a base and the power of 3 an exponent. Sometimes we say power of 3, sometimes we say exponent. Um, we, of course, have a shorthand way of saying 2 to power 2 and 2 to power 3. 2 to power 2 we call 2 squared, referring to the area of a square that has side length of 2. And 2 cubed will refer to a volume of a cube with a side length of 2. Now, it is important to remember for calculations that we're going to perform in this table that exponentiation is nothing but a repeated multiplication. So 2 cubed simply stands for a shorthand way of saying I would like to multiply 2 by itself three times. Okay, so I'm going to have 2 times 2 times 2, which of course is then 8. 2 to power 2 means I'm going to multiply 2 by itself twice, which is 4. 2 to the power 1 means I multiply 2 by itself once. 2 to the power 0 means I multiplied 2 by itself no times, which will give me 1. And in fact, anything to power 0 will be 1. Negative powers are a little bit different. And again, this is just all about notation. Negative power doesn't mean the outcome is going to be negative. It simply means that the power is going to be on the bottom of a fraction. So 2 to the power minus 1 is just 1 over 2 to the power 1. So exponentiation occurs, but in the denominator of a fraction. So this, of course, is 1 half. 2 to the power negative 2 is 1 over 2 squared. So notice that minus just means I've moved into the denominator, but the power, numerical value, stays the same. So 1 over 2 squared, of course, is then 1 over 2 times 2, which is 1 quarter. 2 to the power minus 3 means that it's the power of 3, but on the bottom, and another way to think about that is 1 half times 1 half times 1 half. So multiplying 1 half by itself 3 times, which will give me 1 eighth. Now let's take a look at this table all together. And notice what does that mean for the numbers when the exponents increase. So let's trace this up from 2 to the 0 or from 1. So in this direction, exponents increase. And what does that mean for the corresponding numbers? So as I go exponentially from 0 to 1, 2 to 3, my numbers go 1, 2, 4, 8. So every row I move, I multiply by 2. So exponents increase means numbers get multiplied by 2. And in the opposite, direction of the table here exponents decrease into the negative direction and what does that mean for the numbers on the other side so notice that here i'm introducing a factor of two every every time in the denominator which means that i'm actually dividing by two Okay, and this is important. So that means that as I'm increasing exponentiation exp exponent in the positive direction, I'm actually performing multiplication. If I'm decreasing the exponent in the negative direction, I'm actually performing a division. Let's talk about the notation in general. So 2 to power n means that I've multiplied 2 by itself n times. So this is what a general exponentiation notation means and as we have discussed 2 to the power minus n means that i have 1 over 2 to the power n so the power becomes positive if it's put on the bottom which is the same as saying it's 1 over 2 multiplied by itself once again n times um, and the other way of thinking about the negative powers just like we did here because the numerator here is just 1, I can multiply the numerator by itself many times. So another way of thinking about 2 to the power minus n is to actually think about 1 half multiplied by itself n times. And then, of course, the one interesting case is 2 to the power 0 here, which will be 1, because it's a number multiplied by itself no times. Um, and these are just the basic notations that we need for um, exponentiation. 
all of these rules will work for any number. So here, in all of these, we can replace 2 by any number, and this will still work, okay? Let's now take a look at what will happen if we start performing operations on various um, things that also have exponents in them, okay? And again, we're going to start from scratch and think about what does that actually mean? Exponentiation means repeated multiplication. So I have 3 squared, which means I have 3 twice, times, so this was 3 squared, times 3 to the 5th, which means I have 3 five times. So this represented 3 to the 5th. So what do I have altogether? I have altogether... 3 twice times 3 five times, so in total I have 7 threes, or 3 to power 7. So notice, of course, that this means that if I multiply two things with the same base, then their exponents simply add up to each other. So I can write down the general exponentiation rule, which is a some base a to power m times base a to power n, is actually a to the power of m plus n. Our next example showcases what happens if the numbers you multiply aren't quite the same base yet. So as they are, I can't really simplify them. So 2 cubed means I multiply 2 by itself 3 times, times 8 squared means I multiplied 8 by itself twice. Okay. And so I can't really combine them because they're not the same base. If I would like to put them together as one um, packaged sort of exponent, I'm going to need the same base. And here you actually have a choice. You're either trying to get them to the base of 2 or you're going to try to get them to the base of 8. I'm going to do to the base of 2. Normally we write them in terms of the smallest base. So 8 itself is 2 cubed and this 8 is also 2 cubed. So tallying up what we have um, in terms of 2's in total, we're going to have 2 to the power, there's 3 here, 3 more here, and 3 more here. So overall, I'm going to have 2 to the power of 9. Okay, so in order to perform these kinds of collecting of the terms, they actually have to be like terms, so they have to have the same base. What will happen with the division? 5 to power 7 divided by 5 divided by 5 to power 3. So on the top, I have 5 7 times. And on the bottom, I'm going to have 5 3 times. Now, of course, notice that because everything is a multiplication, these guys are all common factors. So I can cancel out the entire bottom with the top. And on top, I'm going to have 4 5s left. So my result is 5 to power 4. And this also speaks to a general rule that if I divide the same base but different exponents, what happens to the exponents is they simply get subtracted from each other. The next example talks about what happens when a power is raised to another power, 7 squared all to power 3. So notice that this power is sort of the outside most one, which means that I am multiplying 7 squared by itself 3 times. So the way I can expand it is to say it's 7 squared cubed, which means it's 7 squared three times. And then I can, uh, I can tally them up or add these guys all together. So I can see that I'm going to have overall 7 to power 6. Okay, And this is kind of like repeated multiplication on top of repeated multiplication. I'm going to see 7 squared three times which means that in total, I'm going to see 2 times 3 sevens. So the general rule is if I have a power raised to another power, I'm going to multiply the actual exponents. Okay? And then here is example also similar to the one before, um, but notice that my bases are not the same, so I can't quite apply the same rule. So just like in the one above, I also am going to need the same base if I want to simplify as far as possible and keep the exponential form. 
Okay, so 4 cubed is 4 3 times, 8 squared is 8 times 8. I can bring everything down to the power of 2. So 4 is 2 squared, and this was 3 times. 8 is 2 cubed, and it was multiplied by itself twice. So notice that now applying the previous rule here, if it's a power to a power, I multiply them. I'm going to get 2 to the 6 over 2 to the 6, luckily, because 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. Overall, in this case, I actually have a 1. And I didn't even have to pull out a calculator. So please notice that when you're doing some simple arithmetic, sometimes it will literally be faster to do that by hand than with a calculator. Let's try some of these uh, with um, variables. x times y all squared. That means that I multiply xy by itself twice. So xy times xy. But notice that my operation in between x and y is times, and I'm multiplying it by itself, which means that I can move terms around as I wish. So all together, in this case, I'm going to have x squared, y squared. And that speaks to the rule about um, what happens if exponentiation is applied on top of multiplication, because exponentiation is just repeated multiplication, the power can sort of come down on top of both of the terms here, right? So you can think of that as coming down. You're going to have to be careful, though, because if you're going to distribute this in, you really have to distribute it in to be on top of everything, okay? And another example will show you that it's actually the same rule that works for the um, quotient in this case. So I can bring the power down on top of everything if the inside is a quotient, okay? And the last example here, let's take a look at what happens if I have x plus y all squared. That means that I have to multiply x plus y by itself twice. So what I have is x plus y times x plus y. But now the biggest difference between these two examples is the fact that here I had times throughout. But in this example here, I have plus times plus, which means I cannot just shift the terms around. I'm actually going to have to foil this out and make sure I multiply every term by every term. So this will turn out to be x squared, x times x. And then the next term will be xy. And the third term would be yx, which is the same as xy. So there's two of those. And then I'm going to get the y squared. So the total result is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Okay? I cannot stress enough that this is not x squared plus y squared. So the power doesn't just come down on top of a plus because the plus was never a part of um, exponentiation, right? It's not times, so the power cannot just be brought down. This rule, we see so many mistakes of it that this is actually called freshman's dream because every freshman in university wishes that this was true. So as a general rule, if you have a sum or a difference of two things to power n, this cannot be simplified directly. This really needs to be expanded. Okay, so whether you use FOIL or there's more than two brackets and use something else, you actually have to write all the brackets down and then perform um, opening up of the brackets on top of all of them. We'll next talk about fractional powers. So notice in all of our discussions above, all of the powers were always whole numbers. What would happen if they were not? We wouldn't be able to really quite do the exact same repeated multiplication trick. So let's talk about what those mean. Hopefully you remember that fractional powers actually refer to roots or radicals. So let's discuss what roots are. Let's say I give you a number, 16. If I am to compute a square root of it, it means that I have to think of a number so that when squared will result in 16. Now, of course, I know that 4 squared is 16. But I can also notice that negative 4 squared is also 16. That means that 16 has two square roots, a positive one and a negative one. So notice a really big um, thing in notation. If I write square root of 16, 
That means I'm implying, I'm implying that it is in fact the positive one. So square root of 16 is equal to 4. It's easy to miss because, so normally, like for example, this 4, right? I don't write the plus here. Positivity is implied. If I am talking about something negative, I will put a negative in front of it. So if you see just the square root, that implies the positive square root. What about um, if I were to trying if I were to try to take a square root of minus sixteen? Would that work? Well, again, I'm trying to now think of something that when squared will give me minus sixteen. Now, of course, that's not possible because, first of all, I know that the number itself has to be 4 or minus 4 because 4 times 4 is 16, right? But what would happen with the sign? If the number inside is plus 4, then raising it to any power will produce a positive outcome. If the number is negative, I'm going to multiply it by itself twice or even number of times. So all of the negatives that will appear twice will turn into positive and this will not produce anything. So this does not exist. The situation is a little bit different for um, cube roots or any odd power roots. So if I want to think about, let's say, a cube root of 8, that means that I have to think of a number when cubed that will result in an 8. And in fact, there is only one cube root of 8. There's only one number I can put in here to produce an 8, and that will be a 2. If I try to do the exact same thing with the minus 2, I notice that the minuses, so I have to multiply minus 2 by itself three times, so I'm going to have three minuses. Two of them will turn into a plus, but the third one will remain negative, which means that a negative number raised to an odd power will be negative. So I can talk about cube roots of negative numbers now, and they will also themselves be negative. This logic will hold true for any even number roots and any odd number roots, okay? So if I was looking at fourth power root here, I will also only, I will also have more than one result, but a fourth power root of a negative number does not exist. If I'm looking at a fifth root or any other odd root, I also will only have one outcome, but I will be able to take it off negative numbers. A really handy notation here is, so let's say if I'm talking about the nth root of some number a, we write that as a fractional power, 1 over n. And this alone allows me to actually inherit all of these wonderful exponentiation rules that we've developed for whole numbers, okay? So thinking further still, if I have nth root of a to power m, then I can write that as a to power m over n as long as these, this fraction is in lowest terms. In lowest terms. Okay? One way to remember, I don't remember, it was a student of mine that told me once that they remembered this notation as hat and boots. So whatever stays, whatever A comes with as a hat stays on top of a hat, but the boots or whatever is on the bottom actually has to stay outside of the door. Whichever way you choose to remember this notation is perfectly fine. Um, and again, once we actually have that, we manage to inherit all of the exponentiation rules that we've already developed. I'm not going to reprove how this works for fractional rules, um, but you can do that from scratch. The couple of additional shorthands that are, e that, are, that are sort of useful to remember correspond to these last two rules that we've developed. I'm going to essentially rewrite these exact same rules, but using square or nth root notation. So nth root of a times b is nth root of a times nth root of b. So the root, which is a power of 1 over n, can just come down on top of everything here. And it's the same thing if I have the nth root of a over b, then I can distribute the root on top of that. Okay? And watch out once again that no root of a sum or a product can be easily simplified. 
now that we have gone over the exponential rules, let's take a look at a bunch of examples. In all of these examples, please remember that there's always more than one way of doing something. As long as each step is logical and correct, the answer will be correct, even though your pathway to the answer might not look like that of your friend. So let's take a first look at this question here. We start off with 4 to the negative 1, which of course just means 1 over 4 to power 1. And in general, notice that the power of negative 1 simply means a reciprocal. Next comes the term of x squared y cubed all squared. And there's a number of different ways to expand this term out. I'm going to bring the power inside as we've discussed, is possible because the operation on the inside here is a product. As the power comes down on the inside, I have to multiply the powers. So it's going to be x squared squared, which means it's x to the fourth, and then y cubed squared, which will give me y to the sixth, all divided by x to the negative 2, y to the fifth. Okay, and now I simply have to combine the powers of x's and the powers of y, Notice that I'm going to have a quarter out front here. And then combining these two powers of x's, remember then when we divide, we have to subtract. So I'm going to have 4 minus negative 2, which means plus 2. So I'll have x to power 6 here. And for y's, again, it's a division, so I have to subtract powers. 6 minus 5 will give me y to power 1. Excellent. Let's take a look at the next example here. I'm going to do this one in two different ways. So first, I can follow the same path I took in the previous example and bring the power in onto the both numerator and denominator. Again, notice it's a fraction, a division. Therefore, I'm allowed to do that. So then I'm going to have x to power negative 3 to power negative 2. Actually, let me write this out because the numbers here are a little difficult. And the bottom, I'm going to have x to power 5, all to power negative 2. Power to the power means I multiply. So on top, I'm going to have x to the 6th. And on the bottom, I have x to power negative 10. Now it's a division, same base. So I'm going to have to subtract powers. 6 minus minus 10 will be 16. Okay? That's one way of doing this. The other way of doing this is to notice that I can simplify before going any further. So what I might do on the other hand is to first of all take a look at the inside here and combine these terms. It's a division, so I have to subtract powers. Minus 3 minus 5 will be minus 8. So I have x to the power negative 8 all to the power negative 2. And then combining the powers here together, I have to multiply, which will give me x to the power of 16. So as I said, notice that the answer, of course, should be the same, but the way to get to the answer might be quite different. Um, generally, simplifying first will give you the shorter pathway to the answer because you've managed to first reduce the expression as far as possible and then raise it to the power as opposed to dragging the powers with you. So if possible, try to simplify before continuing. Um, in this next question here, notice that I cannot do what I've done before because the operation here as opposed to times and division the operation here is a plus and i cannot simply distribute the power over the plus sign instead i'm going to actually have to write it out so what this is saying is it's this term cubed which means that it's this term multiplied by itself three times and that's what i'm going to write out x squared plus y to the fifth three times and then, in order for me to actually simplify this, I'm going to have to expand all of this out. I'm not going to finish this question because um, this is not terribly educational at this point. Rather, please notice a huge difference between me being able to bring the power down onto the two factors here and me not being able to do this here because the operation here is a plus. Let's take a look at this column now. A lot of this deals with the powers of negative 1. And again, remember, let me just maybe put it on the side here, that the power of negative 1 is simply a reciprocal. So this should make a lot of our simplifications fairly straightforward. 
In the first question here, this highlights the difference between what's in the brackets and what's not. So notice that this first portion, this 2, is outside of the power of negative 1. The only thing that's raised to the power of negative 1 is this a term itself. So if I simplify this, it's going to be 2 times the reciprocal of a. Whereas for the second term, it's all of 4a that's raised to power negative 1. So all of that is going to get put on the bottom. And now, if I want to proceed in simplifying this, because it's a sum of two fractions, I'm going to have to find common denominators between the two. Once again, here, it might be easier to pretend that this is 2 over 1 in order to see how the multiplication is really going to work. So what I have for the first fraction is 2 over a plus 1 over 4 over a. And then in order for me to acquire common denominators, I'll have to multiply this first fraction by 4 on top and bottom. And so on the top, I'm going to have 8 plus 1, which is 9. And on the bottom, I'm going to have the common denominator, which is 4a. Excellent. This next question, once again, please remember that you cannot bring the power down over the sum. That just doesn't work that way. Therefore, it's this whole thing that has to be raised to power negative 1. And therefore, what we get is just 1 over x plus y. And that's it. There's nothing else that I can simplify in here. For this next question here, I have powers of negative 1 on top of powers of negative 1. So I essentially get to decide, do I want to start working from the inside out or from the outside in? And again, this is going to be up to you and this will likely create two very different ways of actually approaching this question. Let me try to work inside out. So first, I'm going to take a look at this guy. x to the negative 1 is just 1 over x plus y to the negative 1, which is 1 over y, all raised to power negative 1. Once again, I cannot stress this enough. You cannot dis distribute the power in for the sum, which means that it's this whole thing raised to power negative 1, and therefore that whole thing has to travel to the bottom of a fraction. Okay, so we have a double-decker fraction here. Um, and if you want to simplify this further, you're going to do common denominators on the bottom and then invert and multiply. I'm going to leave this here, but you can probably take it a few steps further to actually reduce the double-decker fraction to one more simple fraction. This next portion of the questions all uh, deal with fractional powers, and in particular, we're seeing a lot of square roots all over the place. So one thing that's um, kind of handy to remember is what is a square root as a fractional power? A square root is a to power 1, which is then square rooted, so the power on it is 1 half. The other one that's useful to remember is what is a to the power of negative 1 half? Negative means it's on the bottom, so it's 1 over a to power 1 half, which of course is then square root of a. So a to the power of negative a half is a reciprocal square root. Okay, this notation is proving, it will prove to be quite useful for square roots in certain situations. For example, it makes it very obvious why square root times the square root will simply give us a back. And that, of course, is because this square root is a to power 1 half. This square root is a to power 1 half. We we'll multiply, um, we add powers. 1 half plus 1 half is 1, and that is the power of the total here. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at the questions. Square root of 144 means I have to think of a number that when squared gives me 144, which of course is 12. Because, let's write this out, because 12 squared is 144. The next question is square root of negative 64. And now, so I have to think of a number that when squared will give me minus 64, which is not possible. So this does not exist or is not defined, whichever way you prefer to state it. The next one is cube root of negative 64. And so I need to think of a number that when multiplied by itself three times will give me 64. That's going to be minus 4. And let's write it out. That's because negative 4 times negative 4 times negative 4 is, in fact, minus 64. 
So once again here, notice that while I can take, cannot take square roots of negative numbers, I can take cube roots of negative numbers. And that's going to be true of any even and odd roots. For this next question here, square root of 1 ninth, let's remember one of the last rules that we've come up with, and that is the fact that I can distribute the square roots over the fraction, and then I can take it one piece at a time, resulting in one third. Again, this rule of distributing also works because a square root is simply a power of one half, and I can bring the power down over the fraction like we did here. I can also bring the power in over the product, but not the sum, as we will see shortly. Let's take a look at this a to power 2 thirds. First of all, notice that 2 thirds is in fact in lowest terms, which means that I can rewrite this as a root, the corresponding root. So remember that the top number stays with the actual base, whereas the denominator here travels out to become a root. So altogether, this will be a cubed root, because 3 traveled out, of 8 squared. And there's a number of ways to compute this. You can first raise 8 to power 2 and then take a cube root, or do the other way around. Take the cube root of 8 first, and then square the result. Either way will work. Taking the cube root first will actually yield smaller numbers. Cube root of 8 is 2, and then 2 squared will give me 4 as the total final answer. For this next part, notice that I have a square root of 25 times x to the fourth, which means that I can break apart the square root over the factors. So I'll have root of 25 times root of x to the fourth. We are used to dealing with square roots of numbers, and I can take this out fairly quickly and easily. Square root of 25 is simply 5. But what about square root of x to the fourth? And here, either um, you've just done a lot of practice and you can think of that pretty quickly, or you can think of that in a couple of other, in a couple of different ways. So one way to think is what squared will give me x to the fourth, or you can also think of this as x to the fourth all to power one half, which is what the square root corresponds to as a power. And now you can simply apply the um, exponential rules, which say that a power raised to a power, you just have to multiply them by each other. 4 times 1 half is 2, so altogether I get 5x squared. Excellent. This next question here is sort of similar to the one above, but not quite. Here I had a product which allowed me to distribute the square root over it. Here I have a sum, which means that I cannot break up the square root over it. So please, Notice that this is not equal to square root of 4x squared plus square root of 9x to the fourth. That is simply not the case. You cannot distribute square roots over numbers. In case you wanted a little more persuasion of why that's the case, maybe let's take a look here at one quick number example. Try to compute square root of 9 plus 16 in two different ways by actually first adding them and therefore computing square root of 25, or by breaking it up and computing it as a square root of 9 plus square root of 16. Of course, you'll notice that square root of 25 is 5, whereas square root of 9 is 3 plus square root of 16 is 4, and therefore is equal to 7. 5 is not the same as 7, and we know that the order of operations suggests that we do addition, whatever is in the brackets, before we do exponentiation here, so this will be the correct answer, where this will be the one that's not quite right. So breaking it up this way simply does not work. Okay, so this is not correct. So with that in mind, taking a look at this example here means there's very little I can actually do. I can try to fa factor out x to the square power 2 from the inside, and then that is something I can take outside of the square root, but I cannot break it up this way. Okay, so I'm actually just going to leave the square root as is. For this next one here, notice that the power is negative a half, and as we've discussed here, that means it's 1 over the square root of the whole thing. So I have 1 over square root of 81x squared minus 4y squared, and once again, let me recall that I cannot break up the square root over a 
sum or difference, which means that there's nothing else I can really do here. And in this case, I can't even simplify it any further at all. Okay, so this is about as simple as it gets. Can't simplify further. Now, let's take a look at some longer examples where we actually have to combine um, our practice with fractions together with our practice with uh, dealing with um, exponents, in this case, fractional exponents. So first of all, it's a sum of two things, and it's easier to add fractions if we introduce the denominator to each. So this will be with a denominator of 1. So now I have to find common denominators between 1 and square root of x squared plus 4, which of course means that I have to multiply the first fraction by square root of x squared plus 4 on top and bottom. Notice here once again that I cannot simplify the square root of x squared plus 4. It is not equal to x plus 2. Please do not make that mistake. It is one of the most um, one of the biggest mistakes that we see in calculus is when students try to simplify square roots this way, which is simply not correct. Okay, so altogether for the first fraction here, I have square root of x squared plus 4 times square root of x squared plus 4 uh, plus, and then I'm going to get the 1 from the second fraction all over the common denominator of x squared plus 4 square root. Now, uh, square root times itself will give me simply what's underneath it. That's kind of the definition of the square root. So here I'm going to have x squared plus 4 plus the 1 over x squared plus 4. Here now I can combine the 4 and the 1. So I'm going to get x squared plus 5 over square root of x squared plus 4. And this is as far as we can go. So just to highlight this point here one more time, this is not equal to x plus 2. Square roots do not get distributed over the sum. Let's now take a look at this next example, which looks really quite ugly. Um, and let's take it one step at a time. So notice that my main um, operation here is this division sign. Uh, but on top here, what I have is a difference of two things. Um, everything is in square roots here, but here I have a power of negative a half. So it might be better if I turn this into a square root, so it's a bit easier on the eye. So let's just rewrite the top here, 3x plus 1 minus 3x, and then I know that this is the only thing raised to power of negative 1 half, which means that it's going to be 1 over square root of 3x plus 1. So one thing to notice here is, uh, just to be aware of here, is that this minus a half, notice that it only affects the 3x plus 1. It does not affect this 3x. So this 3x will be on top and not on the bottom together with the square root. Now, this whole thing is divided by the square root raised to power 2, which will simply give me 3x plus 1, okay? Now, this top here then actually looks a lot like the previous example, where I have some kind of square root minus something divided by the same square root. So the simplifications for the common denominator and bringing these two fractions here together will look a lot like the previous example, and so I'm going to skip it. And I'm going to give you the final answer here, so please go through and make sure that you actually are getting the answer that I am getting here. You should get 1 over 3x plus 1 times square root of 3x plus 1. There's a number of ways to actually write this. Notice that it's actually the same thing but raised to the different powers. This here is power 1, this here is power 1 half. So we can combine them all together into one power if we so desire. 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves, so I can write it like this. You can actually even write it in a slightly different way. If you prefer negative powers to fractions, we can write this as 3x plus 1 all to power negative 3 halves. Now, equipped with our ability to deal with exponents, including fractional exponents, let's talk about one more thing called rationalizing. 
To rationalize means to get rid of square roots or any other fractional powers. Most of the time, we would like to rationalize as a way to simplify something or to get rid of square roots in the denominator. Now, let's take a look at the examples we have here and discuss what approaches to these will work and which ones will not. So, in all of these cases, I would like to get rid of square roots in the denominator. Let's take a look at the first one. 1 over 2 square root of 6. So, it's this square root that I'm trying to get rid of. Now, the one approach that I see students take all the time is to simply take this expression and square it. Well, think about this. I'm supposed to keep writing equals. So, whatever I write next has to equal to whatever was there before. And squaring something surely changes the actual value. So, it is important to remember that whatever I do has to keep my expression the same as it was before. I'm allowed to change the way it looks. I'm not allowed to change what the physical numerical answer to this is, right? So this is a very important note to take. Cannot change the value of the expression. So I cannot just take the expression and square it. So what else can I do? Well, let's take a look at what we've done before. There's a couple of things that we have seen previously that will become very handy here. For example, this property that we've actually utilized here, and we've noticed how it took place here. If I take a square root and multiply it by itself, that squares the thing and produces whatever was under, underneath the root without the actual square root. So in this case, if I simply multiply the square root by 6 by another square root of 6, then my problem will be solved. I will no longer have a root on the bottom. The problem, of course, is the same as before. I cannot change the value of the expression, which means that whatever I do, whatever I multiply by at the bottom, I also have to multiply at the top in order to... Um, actually cancel things out, okay? And so if I go through this, I'm going to get square root of 6 divided by 2 times square root of 6 times square root of 6. Now, square root of 6 times itself is 6, which means that in the end, I'm going to get square root of 6 over 12. Excellent. I rationalized the denominator. There are no more square roots in the denominator. Let's try to apply a similar logic to this example here. Notice that I no longer have a square root, I have a cube root. Um, and there is, fortunately, a very similar uh, property to square roots when it concerns cube roots. Cube root is a power of one third, which means that I will need three of them to multiply by each other in order for the whole thing to become rational. So if I have three cube roots of six, then my answer will be simply six. So it means that for this fraction, I need to multiply the top and the bottom by cube root of six twice. Okay? And so altogether, then I'm going to have cube root of six twice, so squared on top. And on the bottom, I'm going to have 2 times 6, so 12 as before. Once again, notice that, of course, here I no longer have any fractional powers in the denominator, so the task has been complete. Now, for this next question here, 3 divided by 5 plus root 3. So the problem here is, of course, a little bit different. I cannot simply multiply top and bottom by 3 because by root 3 because then I'll have to foil it in. And I will get rid of the square root here, but I will introduce a square root to the first term. So that doesn't quite work. What comes to the rescue is one very useful um, identity, and that is the difference of squares identity. If I have an expression like something plus something else, a plus b, and I multiply it by the exact same thing but with a negative in the middle, let's take a look at what happens if I foil it out. First of all, I get a squared here. First terms multiply together to give me a squared. Then I'm going to get a b with a negative in front, and then I'm going to get a b with a positive in front. So these two middle terms will cancel out. And then the last term, b times negative b, will give me minus b squared. So by multiplying the expression by what we call its conjugate, 
I get a difference of squares. And this is what this formula is commonly known as, difference of squares. So in our case here, what I would like to multiply the bottom by is the exact same expression, but with a negative in the middle. Okay, so on the bottom here, I'm actually going to write this whole thing out again, just to be clear about what operation I'm doing. So I would like to multiply on the bottom by 5 minus root 3. But once again, because I'm not allowed to change the expression, I'm not just allowed to haphazardly multiply by something, um, I'm also going to multiply the top by the exact same expression, which really just means that they've cancelled each other out, and I haven't actually changed the value of what I'm doing here. Now I'm going to expand everything out. So on top I have 3 times 5 minus root 3. And what do I get on the bottom? If I FOIL it out, I can proceed by FOILing it out, or I can simply use this formula here, and what I get is the square of the first term minus the square of the second term. Rewriting this, I'm not going to bother FOILing it on the top because that's not actually going to be much simpler. I'm going to get here 25 minus 3, which of course is a very rational expression of 22. So I managed to get rid of square roots on the bottom here by multiplying by a conjugate. And that is always going to be the approach if you have a sum or a difference of two terms. Now, please take a look at Module 1B assignment on web work to practice all of the examples with exponents, rational, fractional, whole, um, as well as rationalizing various expressions.